Well, if you're like me, uh, you were expecting Pastor Phil to be in the pulpit this morning. <clears throat> Thursday, uh, he texted me, are you going to be around this weekend? I think I'll probably be feeling better, but just in case, uh, he got a nasty bug, which I think some of us have had, so we can pray that uh, he, he continues to feel better. On Friday, I was talking with him on the phone, and he sounded horrible, his voice, and uh, just wasn't sure that he'd feel well enough to not just cough and hack his way through the message this morning. So it's my privilege uh, to stand in and open the word of God with you. Our text for this morning is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 through 17. The title for the message Pastor Neil picked last week was Together for Holiness. I like that title, so I'm going to steal it. So our title today is Together for Holiness, part two. <clears throat> and really, it makes sense because verses 12 through 17 are tied together with a number of themes and they flow together. And last week, uh, Neil got into verse 15 and that's where I'm going to start because as much as his section needed it, my section needs it as well. So we'll be digging back into that and let's read it together. I just want you to make some observations with me. Get your eyes, your finger in the text and, and see some things as we dive into it. So read with me. We'll go back to verse 12. And start from there. And just a note, I am reading from the New American Standard Translation. That's not because I have anything against the ESV. It's just my Bible of 20 plus years uh, is NASB. And I can't find my way around another one. So New American Standard, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And make straight paths for your feet. So that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for this tremendous privilege you've given us to gather together as your people, as one body, and lift our voices in praise to you and sing songs wherein we exhort each other. Thank you for the gospel truths that we sang through so far this morning and will continue to sing. Thank you now for this blessing we have to open your word together. We are a people prone to distractions. So I pray that your spirit would vanquish those distractions so that our minds and hearts can focus in on what it is you have for us from your word this morning. We ask it in your name. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, just some observations from the text, not the main points, but just sort of um, some grammatical things to start out with. Uh, first of all, in verse 14, uh, as is the case with many sentences or paragraphs, you can have a main verb. Our main verb in this passage is verse 14, where we're told to pursue peace with all men and the sanctification or the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So that's the main thrust here. We're called to be in pursuit of these things, of peace and of holiness. It's to be a vigilant, earnest pursuit. And we're doing this together, hence the title of the message, Together for Holiness. Neil stressed that correctly last week. We together, all of us, are on mission. We're running this race together, and the stakes are high. Pursue peace being the main verb then is connected to uh, verse 15, which starts out in most English translations like a new sentence, see to it or make sure. It's actually a participle and it's adverbial. It's connected to the main verb. And the idea is like this, pursue peace and holiness 
by means of seeing to it or making sure that. And you'll notice there are three that's. You can put your finger on them. That, number one, no one comes short of the grace of God, verse 15. That, number two, no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. And that, verse 16, number three, there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. Uh, so that's our structure. That's the outline. I didn't get it to the media team, so if you take notes, uh, this is where we're going. And really, we're looking at three dangers to avoid as we pursue holiness. And that first one is falling short of the grace of God. Number two is bitterness. And number three is uh, immorality and godlessness, or you could just say, don't be like Esau. And Esau then becomes the illustration of what not to be. So that's where we're headed. And from the outset, I want you to notice, as I said a minute ago, that the stakes are high. You'll see in verse 14, there is this prospect, there is this possibility that some will not see the Lord. And in verse 16, that some will come short of the grace of God. And we'll get into what exactly that means, but you can see that the stakes are high on this race that we are running. So let's dive right into it. Look first at the first danger to avoid as we pursue holiness, and it's falling short of the grace of God. And just to back up, and remember what Neil covered last week, in this pursuit of holiness, uh, there are things that we should be doing. And that's kind of what the emphasis was. Positively speaking, here are these three things that we should be doing. And we saw that in verses 12 through 14 and 15 last week. This week, then, there, there are these three things negatively that we should be avoiding as we pursue holiness together. And the first one starts out in verse 15 with that verbal idea, see to it or make sure. And it's an interesting word. Uh, it is the verb episcopeo. Uh, you probably think of a word that sounds familiar, episkopos or episcopal. That's what we get from that. And it's a word that's used in 1 Peter 5 and verse 1 to describe an aspect of the office of a pastor or elder or overseer. That's the word. It's translated as exercising overright in that text. And so there's a, a pastoral uh, nuance to the word. And as we look at the exhortation here, it, it's not just given to the leadership of this body of believers. It's given to the body as a whole. All of us are called to have this oversight, this watchfulness, this care and concern for everyone around us, everyone who's part of the body. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Yes, I am. So that driving concern for that pastoral watchful vigilance uh, is carried throughout this whole text. And we're called to that as believers, as the body of Christ, as we're on mission running this race together and pursuing holiness. So what exactly does this mean? Uh, to come short of the grace of God, Neil asked the question last week, how can we be saved by grace and yet fail to obtain grace? What's he talking about here? Um, well, certainly he cannot be suggesting that the grace of God can be attained by our pursuit of holiness, by our efforts, by our good works. That defies the very definition of what grace is, unmerited favor from God to us. It can't mean that. And so what does it mean? Certainly, there are many uh, practical applications with regard to availing ourselves of God's grace and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ by means of the spiritual disciplines, reading scripture, prayer, uh, intentionally being committed to the fellowship so that you're encouraged and built up by fellow believers. And in that sense, growing in God's grace. But ultimately, if we look back over uh, the message of the book of Hebrews, we can see that he is greatly concerned that there are those among these Hebrews, these Jews who have named the name of Jesus, who are still in danger of apostasy, of turning away from God, and going back to a Judaism which had formally rejected Christ. 
And in that sense, coming short of the grace of God would be missing out ultimately on the grace of God's salvation and finding yourself on the broad road that leads to destruction. So the stakes are very high here. And I want you to see how this connects with earlier warnings that build throughout the book. That word comes short of the grace of God. It's the idea of missing or failing to reach. So if you, you keep your finger there in chapter 12, you can go back to chapter 4, and we see the same word used here in the context where there is this warning against apostasy, turning away from God. So chapter 4, verse 1, therefore let us, all of us, fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Same verb, come short, missed. There is this possibility that some of the people among that believing community could miss or come short of God's ultimate, final, eternal rest. And the writer is so concerned about it, he says, let us fear at the mere prospect or possibility that this might happen, that there might be someone out here in the congregation, part of this believing community, someone who's made a profession of faith in Christ who will nevertheless turn and walk away from him. This ultimate rest of God is prefigured by the rest of the wilderness generation entering into the promised land of Canaan after the exodus from Egypt. So you go back to chapter 3 and verse 10, and see what the Lord said to that generation. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And then you see why in verse 18 at the end of the chapter, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So they came short of the rest of God. They fell short of that. They didn't enter the promised land of Canaan. And so the writer wastes no time in keying in on that in chapter 3 and verse 12 and says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Take care, brethren, all of you, all of us, as the body of Christ, let's have that pastoral, watchful, oversight kind of attitude, lest there be any single individual among us who would fall away from the living God. What's the solution? Verse 13, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today. Don't wait till tomorrow so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So this possibility of apostasy is very real at this time. And, and the pressure as we see it build throughout this, these people who are in danger of turning away from Christ are people who have been exposed, according to chapter 6, to the good word of God. They've tasted the powers of the age to come. They've even experienced to some extent as they watch the believing community, the ministry and fruitfulness and effect of the Holy Spirit of God. They've seen that. They've experienced it by virtue of their connection with the believing community, but they have not come all the way to God through faith in Christ. And if they turn and go back to a Christ-rejecting Judaism, they're walking away from the only way to be saved. And as we've seen over and over again, I, I don't think this is possible for true believers. Uh, I think scripture is clear in the doctrine of eternal security. Uh, if God has chosen you and saved you, if you are born again, there, there, there's no category in scripture for, for someone who then becomes unborn again. We are secure in Christ. But the question is, are you in Christ? That's what is on the heart and mind of the writer of Hebrews, and I think any pastor who stands in the pulpit, when he, he looks out at a congregation, he knows probably there are people in front of him who have not come all the way to God through faith in Christ. 
And so this message is for all of us, but especially for those who may be in that position. And it is not wrong to ask the question, do I in fact belong to Christ? Am I in fact saved? Paul exhorted the Corinthians to ask themselves that question. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. The scripture speaks of false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, and false brethren. All of those categories are people who are naming the name of Jesus and claiming that they belong to the people of God, and they do not. So the stakes are high here. And I just want you to see, we're still in chapter three here, from the text itself, how this doctrine is presented by the writer. Because if you get it right here, you get it right through the rest of the book. Chapter three, verse 14, he says, for we have become partakers of Christ if, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Theologians call that the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. The true people of God will persevere in faith. They will hold fast to Christ. They ultimately will not let go of Christ. You notice what it does not say. It does not say, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance and firm until the end, then maybe someday when we stand before God, he might let us into heaven. It does not say that. If we're good enough if we're pursuing holiness hard enough, if we do all the right things and go to church and look through stained glass windows and light candles and participate in religious ceremonies, it doesn't say that. And scripture can't bear that out, right? We understand the songs that we sang this morning. We're saved by grace and grace alone. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. If you're trying to establish yourself as right in the, in the sight of God, just stop. You've already failed. Scripture declares that. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's over. (laughs) You can't establish yourself as right in the sight of God. Jesus said the standard is this. You are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So good luck if you're trying for that. No, it's completely and totally by grace. But it is by grace alone, but not a grace that stands alone. Our salvation is dependent completely on grace, but there will be fruit to testify to the fact that we are born again. And that is what is being said here in verse 14. We have become perfect tense, past reality with results that reverberate into the presence. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Our perseverance in faith is what testifies to our possession of genuine salvation. It's not what secures our salvation. So this danger of apostasy, I believe, is very real for these Hebrews. What about for us? How many of you are tempted to go back into Judaism, uh, Christ-rejecting Judaism? You don't have to raise your hand. There could be some who have come out of Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, and and those today who would come out of that will face some of the same pressures that these readers did. But for us, what is it that would move us in the direction of apostasy? There are so many things. Remember the parable that Jesus told about the sower and the seed? The sower, he goes out and he sows seed on all kinds of different soils. And those soils come to represent different responses to the word of God. Several of them are positive, but in each of those initial cases, the people turn away. They apostatize. It's only in the final case where the the seed is sown on the good soil where there is fruit that comes from it that represents the true believer. So there are many different things that could move us away from the Lord into a place of apostasy. I think especially of young people who have grown up in the church. If you... Look at the statistics. Apparently thousands of young people are leaving the church, especially they graduate high school, they go off to college, they can't ditch Christianity fast enough. What is happening there? Well, if you think about it, as adults, right, we have the opportunity to choose whether we go to church, right? Most of us 
as adults, we're here because we want to be here. We're here because we believe we need to be here. We want to sing hymns of praise to God and encourage one another and sit under the teaching of the word. But as kids, I mean, I grew up in the church when I was three years old. I didn't get up and go to church because I had a robust ecclesiology. Uh, some kind of understanding of the commitment to the importance of the gathering of God's people. I went to church because my dad grabbed me and stuck me in the car and we're going to church, right? Uh, and so that was my experience growing up in the church. And somewhere in there, you know, late grade school, junior high and into high school, I had to start grappling with, is my parents' faith my faith? Do I believe what they believe, right? And I think that's natural, for anybody who grows up in the church. And, and the older they get, the, the more you realize, hey, everybody out there doesn't believe what my parents believe. Uh, in fact, you start to realize more and more, I, th I think we're actually in the minority here. Uh, in our culture, I, I, it seems like there's a lot of people out there who, who really don't like what we believe. And, and this whole idea of particularity and singularity, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Like that's really unpopular. And so you start to grapple with that and realize that and if you're going through that as a young person, my question to you is when the bullets start flying because of your connection to Christ, are you going to cut and run? Or do you understand the value of Christ? Is he your Lord? Is he your savior? You understand he is the treasure in the field and it's worth selling all that you own so that you might buy the field because the treasure is there. If you are a young person today, and maybe you're not sure where you're going to land in terms of your belief, in terms of your own faith. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you're at Grace Bible Church. I'm so glad you have an opportunity to be part of the youth group here. If you have questions, you talk to Andrew. You can talk to the other leaders. Talk to me. Talk to, there's plenty of people here, your parents, who want to talk these things through with you. And I would encourage you to do that. Uh, so many other things that could lead to apostasy. Uh, if you think about how we do church today, in the evangelical church, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, there was the church growth movement that kind of swept through a lot of evangelical churches. Uh, and it was this idea that kind of the seeker-sensitive approach, right? We, we got to do church in a new way, in a way that really attracts the lost world. We want them to feel comfortable when they come into our building. And so when they hear our music, we want it to be like the music that they like. And uh, when it comes to preaching, it should probably be like maybe 12 minutes and just away with the sage on the stage and let's bring in the guide on the side and just kind of sit in the stool and we'll just have a talk. And everyone will feel good about themselves when they leave. And maybe we'll talk about how to tweak your marriage and make it a little better, sort of DIY Christianity, sort of some things that are really helpful. And when you leave, you're like, man, I feel good. I feel, I'm a good person, and this is great. Um, but in some cases, if, if you look at the church as a car, you know, you open the hood and you're asking, is there an engine there? Uh, the engine would be the gospel, right? Is the gospel there? Is the church preaching the gospel? Because what you win them with is what you keep them with. So are they preaching the gospel? And in some cases, they were not. They were just preaching this general sort of whitewashed message. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which is true. But to the unbeliever, he's hearing, cool. Uh, big house, fast car, pretty wife, and all the other things I want. And so he's like, sure, yeah, I'll try Christianity. And the church, uh, as part of the strategy of the church growth movement, you know, we're going to send out this glossy mailer, this flyer, to all the people in the neighborhood, especially those who are the right demographic, young people, beautiful families, so we can put their pictures on our website. And, well, I guess we can keep the old people too because we need somebody to pay the bills. <clears throat> but it's this really kind of sort of like business savvy tactic to get the right people in the church and to get them in the church, you, you got to craft this message that's appealing to someone who's not a believer. Well, the gospel is not appealing to unbelievers. And Paul said the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, and it's a stumbling block, and it's, it's an offense to the Jew. It's foolishness to the Greek, and it's offense to the Jew. So if we're not preaching the gospel, what is it that people are converting to? In some cases where people came to the church and said, well, I'll try that. God loves me, has a wonderful plan for my life. Sounds great. They go, they try it. It's like, this is fun, 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 but nothing changes in their lives. Their marriage actually doesn't get better. And they don't get the big house and the fast car and the, all that other stuff. And, and so they just kind of drift away and walk away and they leave. But what did they leave? Was this a believer becoming an unbeliever? No. 
They just walked away from whatever that is. So it's very important as the church and as individuals, as we think evangelistically in terms of, of, of calling people to God, what is it that we're calling them to? And do they understand just how holy God is and therefore how much of a sinner they are? Because until sin be bitter, grace will not be sweet. They won't run to the Savior because they don't understand why he even died and why it even matters. So we have to preach the gospel. And as we come back to Hebrews 12, our text in verse 15, this warning then against the potential that some might come short of the grace of God is a very real possibility. And all of us should be vigilant and watchful in our community groups, in our larger gathering. Are there people here who do not yet know the Lord? And if you're one of those people, again, so glad you're here. Praise God. We're gonna have people here after the service for prayer if you want prayer. If you have questions, talk to me, talk to Neil. There's plenty of people in here who would love to talk to you about Christ and where you stand with him. So see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Secondly, and really the rest of these are related. He's on that same focus, warning against apostasy, okay? The second danger to avoid is bitterness there in verse 15. But really it's personified here, and, and it's warning against the person who can become that root of bitterness. The person who is about to turn away from God and his influence could have an impact on the rest of the body. So it says that no root of bitterness springing up and you can see this noxious weed as it grows and then starts to cause trouble. And certainly in that context, if you had this person... He's starting to drift away from the believing community. In chapter 10, verse 25, they were doing that, right? Do not forsake the assembling together as is the habit of some. Some had started doing that, withdrawing from the believing community. And so those people could start to become this root of bitterness that could have its influence on the rest of the body. And so he says it it, it causes trouble and by it, many can be defiled. So he says, don't let this happen on your watch. Watch out for this. And just as a practical note, I know in in biblical counseling, this text is so helpful in terms of the the general concept of bitterness and the danger of bitterness in your own life. Uh, Holding on to something. Uh, Somebody has wronged you. Somebody has hurt you. And and bitterness says, I'm going to hold on to that. And, And it festers and it grows into that noxious weed. The same word is used in Ephesians 4.31. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. All those things go together. Think about it. It starts with bitterness. It says, let all bitterness. What happens if you hold on to bitterness? You know, the word forgive means to let go. And there's so much freedom and joy in letting go. And forgiving. But if you hold on to that bitterness, what's it lead to? Well, wrath, anger, clamor, and then this starts happening slander and malice. And that just kills a local church. Paul said, if you bite and devour one another, in that context, I think that was in Galatians, um, he's very concerned about how this how malice and slander and gossip can start to tear the body apart. And so we're being told here to be vigilant and watchful against this. So if this is happening and it's coming to your ear and the content is about somebody else, that's when we need to say, hey, have you, have you talked to that person, right? Uh, and treat other people the way you want to be treated. If, if somebody's got a problem with me, I, I don't want them talking to other people about it. I want them talking to me about it, please. Um, And if we're truly believers, we need to have the the humility to receive what people need to talk to us about, right? We're all part of a family here. We've got to communicate. And he says, don't, don't, don't let bitterness come into that, okay? And that's the second danger to avoid. Uh, You know, again, as, as we look at this pursuit of holiness, in terms of a race, it's a marathon, right? It's not a sprint. 
uh, from start to finish, you know, our lives in comparison to eternity are, are short, right? Like a vapor which appears for a little while and vanishes. But it doesn't always feel that way, does it? Uh, man, you're going through a trial. You're going through a hard time. Life seems to just slow down, right? And, and it's hard and it's difficult. And, and that's why, like, like Neil was preaching last week, if, if, if your hands are starting to droop and, and your knees are getting weak, all of us need to come alongside those people and help them. We need encouragement. I'll tell you a little story, give you a breather um, <laughs> from the data dump here. Uh, so I had the opportunity to go to the Moody Bible Institute uh, back in early t- 2001, and uh, it, it was a tough start for me. I'm coming from beautiful Bend, Oregon, going to this huge city. I'm not a city guy, and it's in the middle of winter. It's freezing cold. Bend is not cold, okay? Chicago is cold. There's snow on the ground. It's yet dirty, brown because it's a city, and it's never going away because it's that cold. And then there's the wind chill factor, right? It's the windy city. So freezing cold. I'm in the middle of downtown in these old Gothic buildings. I'm eight stories up on a 19-story building, and I was convinced that all of the police cars and fire trucks went around my building all night, <laughs> every night. You live in the country, and you move to that, and so it was... It was it was not fun, and it was a hard adjustment for me, but I was excited to be able to study the Bible under some great men of God. And one of my professors, I had read about him, never met him. His, his name was Dr. Ron C. Sauer, Ronald Sauer, that cool German last name, which, which just convinces you that he's very academic. <laughs> and I read that he studied under Bruce Waltke at Dallas Theological Seminary and under the eminent New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce at the University of Manchester. I'm like, yeah, this guy... He's going to be a great New Testament scholar. What I didn't know about Dr. Sauer is that he was also a captain in the Marine Corps. He had fought in an extremely bloody battle in Vietnam and been the only man to survive in his platoon. He actually made a movie about it. And he was also from the South, from Mississippi. So he had this thick Southern accent. So the first day I walked into his class, and some of you have heard the story, I realize. Some of you haven't. And uh, he's standing with his back to us. And the class is back here, and he's writing on the whiteboard. And the first words I hear out of his mouth, he turns around. He says, oh, class, come to order. I'm like, all right, okay. This should be interesting. And he had this habit of memorizing all of our names, our, our first initials and middle names. And that's how he would address us. And I had him for Greek, which is great, because he's like this drill sergeant, and you need that if you're learning a language like that. And so... Just point blank, he would call you on you in class and he'd say, uh, B, Caleb, uh, parse this verb for us. You're like, uh, present active indicative first person plural from Luo. And he looked at the rest of the class, he'd go, uh, class, is he right about that? <laughs> it was great. So anyways, I ran into him one day in the lunchroom and this was the beginning of a new semester. And I'm completely overwhelmed with all of my syllabi and all the classes I've got to take and the papers I have to write and the exams and everything. And I'm just, ugh, I have this heavy weight, right? And I run into him in the lunchroom and he says, uh, B, Caleb, how are we doing? And I kind of just like unloaded on him, you know, just, okay, well, man, I've got all this stuff and all these classes and, uh, uh, and he looks at me and he goes, well, you better take a deep breath and hold it because we got a long way to go. (laughs) Well, honestly, that was exactly what I needed to hear. And as we run this race of faith, sometimes we got to come alongside each other and, and sort of say as much, right? We do have a long ways to go. And we're called to perseverance. We're called to pursue holiness and peace and keep at it, right? So we've got to encourage each other as we're doing that. Let's look thirdly at the, at the final danger to avoid as we pursue holiness together, and that is in verse 16, the final that, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. And it's literally, lest there be any fornicator or heathen, you could say, um, It's focusing, again, on a person, like the root of bitterness could be a person. Uh, This is the person, we want to make sure that nobody becomes that person in our midst, right? 
So let's look at these two things. We'll look at the example of Esau, but, but these two things, they're two words, pornos he bebelas. The pornos is related to the cognate noun porneia. Obviously, we get the word pornography from it. Uh, but it's the larger umbrella term in the Greek uh, for any and every form of sexual sin. It covers the whole gamut. Heterosexual sin, homosexual sin, adultery, incest, and anything else you could think of, it fits under the umbrella of this term. And uh, in chapter 13, we're going to get what I would call a, a biblical theology of sexuality. And, and there, it, it, it describes that as a gift from God to be enjoyed in the context of marriage. You have one man, one woman, united together in the covenant relationship of marriage. And it says in that context, the marriage bed is undefiled. And that's good. And it's a gift of God. But everything outside of that is a perversion of what God intended. And so there's a warning here against that. And there is that same warning in a lot of other passages. This concept of sexual sin, of immorality. It's mentioned again and again and again in the New Testament, isn't it? That's because it's common. For us as men and women, chances are probably at some point you've struggled with sin in this area in your own life. Maybe you're struggling with that right now. Uh, scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Okay, this is common, all right? It's not okay. We need to put it to death in our lives, but we also need to understand that you're not isolated if you're struggling with this. Oh, nobody would understand this. this and it's a secret dark thing because it's considered scandalous and all that stuff, but it's just one of many sins called out in scripture and we need to come alongside each other and help each other get the victory over that. And, and that's that pastoral, watchful care and concern that we have here. It's not pointing fingers. It's not, oh, I discovered you. You sin in this area. It's not that. It's this concern and desire to come alongside and help each other get the victory in that area. Okay, so that's the first one that he deals with, immorality. The second one, bebelos, is godlessness or worldliness. It, it's not so much the formal academic idea of being against the concept of God, like an ivory tower atheist. It's not that. The person who is this just doesn't even care whether there's a God or not. He's oblivious to that. He doesn't even think about that. He's so concerned with what's right in front of him and, and doing what he wants to do, what his flesh wants to do in the moment. It's materialistic. It's, it's hedonistic. That, that's the idea that's being conveyed here. And there's a warning against it, and Esau then becomes the perfect example of it, right? Who sold his own birthright for a single meal. What kind of a trade was that? He takes something of tremendous value and he exchanged it for something just very common and insignificant, right? You remember the story? Uh, Jacob is brewing this pot of stew or soup and apparently it's reddish in color and so Esau comes in and he's hungry. He's been out in the field. He's the hunter. He's daddy's boy and Jacob's mama's boy and, and, and he sees the stew and he says, give me some of that red stuff and Jacob says, give me your birthright. Some of your birthright. And it, it's almost just like Esau's like, okay. And I mean, being a fly on the wall, kind of looking at that situation, you go, whoa, whoa, what? What do you mean, okay? Like, I mean, his reasoning is, well, I'm so hungry, I might die anyway, so what's the point of my birthright? He actually, it's ironic how we can rationalize when we're tempted by sin, Right? We can come up with a reason that makes sense in the moment if you just don't think about it too much. Sure, yeah, okay, here you go. Here's my birthright. Really? Okay. Well, that's what he does because he is this godless kind of man. He, he's not concerned about the greater transcendent realities, life and death and eternity and, and, and the blessing of God on his life. Just, yeah, give me a bowl of soup. Give me some of that red stuff. And then here's the, the terrible consequence. He has to live with this decision that he's made. Verse 17, for you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. And it's like this final, you can't go back, you can't change it. Very sobering. If you think about Esau then, 
as an example of what the writer's talking about, apostasy, what is the birthright? The birthright is this, this, this gift of grace. It's not something you earn. It, it's something that's given to you. It's a blessing. And he forfeited that because he just didn't even care about it. It's like someone coming short of the grace of God. They just, they just don't realize how important and significant that is, and they just they turn away from it and go after whatever the other thing is. That can't be comparable in terms of value. You think, too, about Esau as being a man who was in a position closest to the one man on earth at the time who had received the most revelation from God. Right? Think about that. God started to speak to Abraham and started to call out a people to himself through Abraham. And then Abraham has a son, Isaac. And Isaac is Esau's dad. And so Esau is the closest human being you could say next to Jacob, who's also there, and Rebecca, who's connected there. But of all the people on the, on the globe at the time, Esau has the most light. He knows the most specifically about God's special revelation. But he's oblivious to it. He doesn't care about it. He just cares about what's right in front of him. And we too, especially this side of the cross, especially with the completed canon of scripture, we have the light of God's revelation. We have the gospel. We have new covenant truth. And this tremendous opportunity in front of us to embrace it. And so the prospect that there would be some people exposed to this truth, to the gospel itself, who would not come all the way to God through faith in Christ for whatever reason and eventually would drift away is just shocking. And that is the warning and the call for us to be guarded and, and pastorally concerned that this would not happen on our watch with anyone here. And as we close Today, I, I just would extend the call of this text. If you are here today, if you do not know where you stand before Christ, if you would heed what Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith and you're not sure, it'd be a great time to talk to someone about that, starting with God. And let's talk to him about that right now. God, we thank you so much for the call of this text for us to be vigilant as your people in our concern and care for everyone around us in this body at Grace Bible Church. I pray as we go forth today that, that we would carry that concern into our daily walks, phone calls we need to make with friends, conversations we need to have, uh, community group as we meet this week and fellowship groups and youth group and that you would do a work in your people. We thank you that your word does not return to you void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which you've sent it. And we praise you in your name. Amen.